an overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 26, through chapter 9, verse 9. Messiah's Power. We're still in the fourth section of the ninefold structure of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' Mission, Messiah's Message and Work. In this lesson, we shall look at Messiah's power over demons. He annuls Satan's right to rule over fallen humanity. His power over death. He reverses the results of the fall. And his power over disease. He commissions human beings to heal the sick, the diseased, and the oppressed. Messiah's power over demons. What do you see in the picture? Discuss this together. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Many demons had gone into him. Now, most demon-possessed persons are neither crazy nor violent, often more to be pitied than to be feared. But this man was violent. There were actually two men, according to Matthew chapter 8. Luke deals with only one of them. He had not worn clothes for some time. This may indicate a moral issue. But he did live in tombs. According to the beliefs of the day and to many traditions to this day, Tombs are places where spirits or even ghosts may haunt. It was a practice at the time, especially amongst Gentiles, to make sacrifices to demons and then leave those sacrifices at the tombs of their deceased ones. If this man had been eating that food, then he may have contacted more demons through those sacrifices. Thus there were two demoniacs, according to Matthew chapter 8, whilst Luke tells us about one of them. Tombs were unclean haunts of demons, according to local belief. And had these men been consuming pagan sacrifices for the dead, left at tombs by their relatives, this could lead to further demonization. Paul warned Christians, I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink, or you must not drink the cup of the Lord, and the cup of demons. If there is a real communion with demons through the drinking of sacrifices, how much more is there a real communion with the Lord Jesus Christ through participation in the bread and the cup of communion? What do you see in this picture? Rearranging the verses slightly to put them into chronological order, we read, When one demon-possessed man saw Jesus, He cried out and fell at his feet. Jesus commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. But the impure spirit, shouting at the top of his voice, said, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torture me. These words recall the language of Psalm 91, a messianic psalm in which we are told that Messiah would dwell in the shelter of the Most High, that is, the Almighty God, and that he would have power over the demon creatures described in verses 5 and 6. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Satan chose this psalm when he spoke to Jesus, Quoting verse 12, His angels will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What do you see in the picture? Jesus asked the demon, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. The demon actually lied, for a legion could be as many as 6,500. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, 
and he gave them permission. Oh, how nice of Jesus. He's even kind to the demons. Well, wait, they did not want to go into the abyss. What was that? The abyss, according to the ancient book, First Enoch, whose language the New Testament borrows, there waters gathered together, and I saw a deep chasm or abyss in the earth. As regards both height and depth, they were immeasurable. This is the prison for the stars of heaven and the host of heaven, that is, for those angelic beings that had rebelled against God, some of which became the demons dwelling upon the earth. Thus, by going into the pigs, and the pigs drowning in the water, these demons were plunged into the abyss upon the death of those unclean pigs. So what do we see in the picture? When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Now we observe that only Gentiles or non-observant Jews who were considered apostates kept pigs. According to some Jewish traditions, demons could die. What does the pig's response to demons teach us about non-saved human beings? If you die without Christ, you go to the same destiny as the wildest of demons. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now think about this. If Jesus was able to take the worst case of human depravity, fear, and degeneracy and heal the man in only a few minutes, what could he do for you and me in the space of only a few minutes if we come to him, confess our sins, ask to be saved, and receive the Holy Spirit? Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. Now, why would they be afraid of seeing a former demoniac acting normally? And why would they be overcome with fear at the presence of Jesus in their ignorance they took Jesus to be some kind of a magician who had power over demons and could very well then cause those demons to attack other people. So they asked him to leave. How does Jesus reply to those who ask him to leave? Now discuss answers to these queries. Why were the people afraid at seeing the man in his right mind? Why were they overcome with fear after learning how the man had been cured? Why did the people ask Jesus to leave the region? So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town, how much Jesus had done for him. So, how does a former demoniac feel about Jesus? Why did Jesus say to tell others about what God had done when it was Jesus who had done it? What did Luke want us to learn about Jesus? Jesus himself had said, If I alone bear witness about myself, then my testimony is not deemed true. So rather than going around telling others, I am God, what did Jesus do? Rather than saying who he was, Jesus showed who he is, the promised Messiah who does the work of God. Messiah's power over death. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jerus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, 
pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about twelve, was dying. Synagogue leader was an honorific title given to a wealthy man who supported the synagogue. His only daughter, the Greek term monogenes, meaning one of a kind, may imply that she was his only child. The same word is used of the dead young man in 7.12 and in John 3.16 that speaks of God giving his one and only son. So, the child's gender and age meant that she was not to be touched by an adult male. And, of course, to touch a corpse made one unclean. So, on the way to Jaru's house, who is this that you see in the picture? As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Some manuscripts contain the phrase, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians, possibly transported by a scribe from Mark 5.26. How are the accounts of the child and of the adult connected, besides happening at the same hour and the same day? Note that the woman's continual flux kept her unclean under Mosaic law. This implies that either she had not been able to marry, or she was no longer married and so possibly destitute. What is Jesus asking? Who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Think for a moment about Jesus as a source of life-changing power that flows from him to those who come to him. What does power flowing from Jesus tell us about who he is? Some charlatans believe that power flows out of them. What fools! Whoever touched an unclean person became unclean for the rest of the day. What does this imply for Jesus entering Jaru's house? Has this woman just rendered Jesus unclean? And what does this imply for us in whose midst Jesus is present? During Jesus' three and a half years of ministry, he collected a great deal of uncleanness and of other people's sins, which he then bore to the cross. None of this limited his capacity to heal. What do you see in the picture? Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of everyone, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Daughter is a very respectable way in which one of higher social class speaks tenderly to another. Your faith has healed you. Not the amount of your faith, not the intensity of your faith, but the object of your faith, the one in whom you have trusted. Go in peace. When Jesus has touched you, your life becomes peaceful, despite of what happens around you. Whilst Jesus was still speaking, Someone came from the house of Jerus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, said he. Don't bother the teacher any more. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jerus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Notice that some manuscripts read, Stop bothering the teacher. Do you see a verbal mismatch? How do you heal a corpse? First observe, just believe. You might discuss, believe what? Believe whom? Our translation says, she will be healed. The Greek original reads literally, she will be saved. This is a different word from that used in verse 48, where Jesus said, your faith has healed you. 
So what is Luke signaling to us readers by using the words believe and save it together? You can think of Bible verses that match these two words. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So why saved? Saved means to be raised from death back to life, both in this story and elsewhere in Scripture. Ooh, what are these ladies doing? When he arrived at the house of Jerus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, those outside were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, said Jesus. She is not dead, but asleep. Was Jesus lying? Now, historical sources tell us that two flute players and a mourning woman were required at the funeral of even the poorest person. Being a man of wealth, Jarius could afford many more. There had to be a way to let neighbors know immediately across Africa there is a mournful ululation. Upon hearing the ululation, the neighbors knew then that the sick child had passed away. Oh, describe what you see in the picture. The crowd laughed at Jesus, knowing that she was dead. Now, were they laughing to scorn him, or were they laughing because they were embarrassed for him? When to laugh and not to laugh is decided by one's culture more than by a particular emotion. But Jesus took her by the hand and said, My child, rise up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Now the phrase, her spirit returned, employs the Greek term pneuma, which is often translated wind or breath. And so we could translate here, she began breathing again and stood up. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Messiah's Power Over Disease When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. He called the twelve. Some manuscripts have replaced the word twelve with the term disciples or apostles. Twelve is most likely original. When Jesus said not to take along a bag or money, he may have been referring to a beggar's money bag. One type of anti-worldly philosopher who expressed independence from social needs by begging. Cynics owned only the barest necessities, for example, a cloak, a staff, and a begging purse, and often greeted passers-by with harsh antisocial words, whereas Jesus forbade his apostles to carry a begging purse. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, then leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Jesus had said to proclaim the kingdom of God, that is, God's chosen king has come, and the good news is that Messiah is here, and to prove it, we heal your sick, and we deliver your demoniacs. Wherever, whenever, however, you and another Christian intentionally go to non-believers, telling them the good news about Jesus, God will answer your prayers by meeting needs that they have. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. If you are in a ministry of evangelism, 
of church planting or of home group multiplication, you must do the same. You must learn how to coach workers who start and lead small groups. To do so, you may follow these seven steps. To coach church and cell leaders. When you meet them, ask the Lord to reveal his wisdom. Then listen to workers report on what they learned from their reading assignment that you had given them previously. Then listen carefully to their report on their group's progress and new opportunities. Then lay new plans to implement immediately, especially to take advantage of opportunities. Then assign Bible text for workers to read and a training booklet, reminding them that you will listen to their report when they return next time, which will allow you then to track their learning and to correct their mistaken notions. Then practice together any needed new skill that they might require to implement their plans. And then take time to pray by name for new workers to arise and for members of their new cell groups or new little churches. God will answer your prayers. So then, from this lesson, what truths will you affirm? What promises will you claim? What commands will you obey? Your assignment for next time is to read through the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 10 through 62, in different translations if you have them. If you can, visit the website for other resources. Whilst you read, compile your insights, your queries, and your observations that you can share with others.